Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Morning, Lam. Okay, thank you for uh, being here this morning. Uh, my name is Lam, uh, Lam Wong. I'm the curator for the current show at Canton Sardine right now. It's called Imaginary Portrait. And with the artist Pierre Coupe and Dean Kleiner, here we're going to talk about their works and their inspiration. But before we do that, I just want to do a land uh, acknowledgement uh, about Canton Sardine is situated in unceded territory and tradition territory of Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil too. So we are very grateful to be in this place. Okay, so maybe uh, my first question for, um, for you both is, yeah. uh, you can feel free to jump in, then yeah. it's, uh, how, how do you meet, because I know Pierre, you came from Montreal, Quebec, and you were born in the US, US, but studied in Nova Scotia That's and right. ended up in Vancouver. So I was just curious about how, how do you meet and how do you started a, this kind of artistic journey? Well, I think I first <laughs> encountered Dean at uh, an opening of one of my shows at Gallery Jones. That's right. Mm. And okay. uh, then I would see Dean around at other uh, exhibitions, you know, openings. And mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of intrigued, you know. Here is this, you know, standout looking guy and it was always very, you know, you can tell when people are looking at work mm. or they're just there to socialize. Yes, yes. And uh, I could see Dean is actually looking at the work as well as being very social. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, you know, got curious and I thought, well, you know, what does this guy do? And I found out that Dean was uh, both a uh, writer about art and a sculptor. Mm. And... Uh, and I was having a uh, catalog uh, coming up for one of my gallery shows in Toronto. Mm. And uh, at an opening, I approached Ian and said, would you be interested in writing an essay? Because I'd read his essays on his website. And I thought, well, yeah. here's a good writer. Yeah. And there are not right. too many good writers about mm. art. Okay. <laughs> Far and few between. And, uh, and I was really pleased. He said, yes. And so that began that part of the relationship and working on the catalog essay. Okay. So, Dean, do, do you have anything to say about Pierre? <laughs> well, no, as glowing, yeah, sure. <laughs> we agree that there's not uh, a lot of writers that we like about mm. uh, with a certain clarity and <clears throat> directness, a simplicity, so anybody yeah. can read and absorb what the work is about. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I Gallery Jones was one of the first galleries I walked into when we moved to Vancouver. Okay. Um, this is in the 90s? We, no, 2003. 2003, okay. We came to Vancouver. Yeah. Um, it might have even been one of Pierre's shows that was up that when we came in. But I liked the gallery. I liked the, uh, the people that worked there. And I started to write. Uh, the first piece I wrote about a gallery Jones artist was James Nizam. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, I, know, I, know, yeah I know James. Yeah. Yeah. And so then I kept coming to the gallery, kept seeing Pierre's shows and liking them and then yeah and he approached me and because i already knew his work and respected his work it was an easy thing to say yes i'll write about it and then i you know started to visit the studio to see more what am i writing about and it developed you know the friendship developed and the respect developed and and then the inspiration developed okay yeah. i was understand you hmm. both also have a previous shows together can well, you I talk had. A uh, bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I, I had a show at Gallery Jones, and after uh, doing a studio visit at uh, Dean's studio, yeah. which is really a beautiful studio. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's classic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, uh, and I thought, mm. well, this work has to be seen more. Mm. And so I asked Gallery Jones whether they would give me permission to invite Dean to show with me at mm. my, the next solo show, and yeah. they were agreeable and it was great and so we had a mm -hmm. kind of a joint show there okay the first yeah. joint show yeah and uh and the relationship has continued did yeah. you remember the year yeah. of that i'd have to look at my website i can never remember dates oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yeah. not more two three years ago maybe at the most three years i think around three years ago okay. yeah okay yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah it was very generous of pierre to force his gallery to let me come in. No. <laughs> it wasn't because it didn't take a lot of force. <laughs> I just threatened I'd quit. Well, that's right. <laughs> that's probably a win 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 situation for yeah. so everybody happy, right? Yeah. But yeah. see I, I like I prefer that my sculpture be shown with painting. Mm -hmm. So in the past I I I've tried to show it with my wife 
Darcy Mann, she's a painter. Right. And pushing the pieces, the sculptures, very close against the painting. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. that, so you can't see one without the other. Yeah. Not that they belong right. together, but that they, it gives them a context. Because sometimes I find sculpture, when it's alone and kind of isolated on a pedestal, it looks abandoned. Yeah. Right? Because it looks a bit lonely. Right, yeah. And so I, I think painting, the right paintings, you know, it, it works really well. Absolutely. They both gain from that close juxtaposition. I like. Yeah, no, I it, yeah. Right, it's closer to the way people would see it at home. Right. Right, within the jungle mm -hmm. of their Yeah, of I, their couldn't, uh, I couldn't, yeah, I agree more. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, I think that's one of the one, wonderful thing about this show as yeah. well, that with forming that kind of conversation between a sculpture and painting, uh, not, not just painting, but we also put a lot of thought on like the color, the relationship, right. unified by literatures and histories and all that. So yeah, yeah that's, I think that's really working out really well. Mm -hmm. uh, can you briefly just maybe describing like your, your practice, you know, just, yeah, like about your art making process? You go ahead. Process and practice. Okay. Um, almost exclusively sculpture. Okay. Um, the medium is now exclusively plaster uh, and different mixes of plaster, stucco. Mm -hmm. um, over wood and copper armatures. Okay. So, I mean, that's all I've been doing for, for a couple decades is concentrating on plaster. Okay, very persistence. <laughs> <laughs> Stubbornness. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, you have to be stubborn to be an artist, period. Stupid, you, you do it stupid, even longer. Stupid, stupidly stubborn yeah. uh, to continue for as long as certainly I have. <laughs> mm. uh, my practice is simply painting and everything else is ancillary, drawing, printmaking, mm. etc. cetera. And, uh, and I guess, you know, I find it very hard to try to talk about and describe what I'm doing. Mm. You know, naturally I prefer the work to speak for itself, etc., yeah. and all of that yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. But uh, basically I'm involved in exploring forms of abstraction, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. although there are always sorts of figurative elements that come into play either at the beginning of a painting or mm -hmm. during the process of making the painting right. uh, whether residues of those appear or not mm. uh, rarely but they, mm. they can be there okay. and uh, but basically I'm looking at painting as a process which most people do mm -hmm. and so it's a process of development by transformation for example I I'm doing three paintings right now with their, in the intention, and you have to be aware of your intentions, mm -hmm. as for one to be black, one to be white, one to be gray. Right. Well, the gray one, I just absolutely destroyed the <laughs> next day because it simply wasn't good enough. Yeah, yeah. And it may become a black one. So, I mean, you, you, you get waylaid by your intentions yeah. or you, you allow things to occur. Yeah. It's not entirely haptic. It's not entirely without concept. Mm -hmm. I think all these kinds of categories are things that... Uh, can confuse people. Right. I take a holistic approach to what I'm doing mm. and it can involve many dimensions and I'm very Catholic and heterogeneous about mm. it. I'm not a purist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so that, actually that's a, what the good point that you brought out about destroying, you know, in the process of, of our making. Yeah. I'm just curious about how many pieces, do you guys destroy a lot of pieces throughout the process or how, how yeah? Um, right now, I destroy nothing. You destroy nothing? No. Okay. Um, I destroy nothing because I believe that I am not the best arbiter of mm. what is mm. worthwhile in what I do. Yeah. Because I recognize that other people come in yeah. and they like the thing that I like least. Right. Okay. Uh, so I trust myself enough that anything I make, yeah. I'll yeah. retain. Mm. So, I'm, I mean, maybe in years I might come to destroy a thing, but mm. not frequently. Mm. And part of the reason is because now when I start a piece, yeah. I have an intention. Yeah. But as soon as in the process, as I'm making a sculpture, as soon as it does something I like, yeah. I stop. Uh -huh. So I'm always stopping at a point where I like what I have. Right. I no longer go too far mm. and have to backtrack. Yeah, you also have a belief that when the viewer is looking at the work, or even the artist, 
you, we don't see the whole picture. We only see very limited of what the work is offered. Can, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, th I think to begin with, we don't ever see the work that's in front of us. Mm. I don't think we can see what we're looking at really, mm. because I think we see it through a huge ghostly parade of all the other art right. and other things in the world that we've experienced that mm. these things remind us of. And I, then I think we see that through all of it. Mm. So it's very hard to just see that without the ghostly parade, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, also think, you know, it's impossible to see all the things that I'm thinking about when I make the work, which I think are in the work. I see. Right, so, yes. yeah, I'm, I'm hard to see the work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Pierre, do you have anything to add about destroying paintings? Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, it's perhaps different for a painter. I yeah. mean, yeah. I have destroyed a lot of work, and of course the work gets destroyed in the process of making it. I mean, in any given painting there may be three or four paintings underneath that right. surface that you see. Yeah. So it is always a, 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 a commotion between the seen and the unseen. Yes, yes. Uh, but I think that, uh, for speaking for myself, uh, that yeah, you, the work should go beyond your intentions. If it's smarter than you, well then you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. you hope it's smarter than you That's are. Right. And, uh, and yes, you, there are times when you do have to trust that it is there, mm -hmm. despite whether you like it or not. So I keep a lot of paintings that I don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know at a certain level that whether something has a, you know, deserves to live or die, and, right. you know, and I'm ruthless about it. Yeah. And I think a lot of artists are not ruthless enough about editing their work. Mm -hmm. Also, oh, it's getting to the point where, ah, no, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but especially, yeah. I guess, for abstraction painter, because you have to be kind of in the moment. You, 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 there's nothing planned, whatever. So there's a lot of risk involved. There and is. Yeah, you can, yeah. yeah, like one gesture, you can turn the painting upside down. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then there's also the nature of the paint itself. Mm. I mean, when you're painting so many layers, especially with oil, yeah. then there comes a certain point where, you know, paint layers can fail. Right. Uh, or it simply doesn't give you the kind of tactile and visual response that you want. Mm -hmm. And so the feeling goes dead. Yes. And so the feeling, the surface has to be alive all the way through. Yeah. And then, you know, let's face it, you can't hit a whole run every time. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes you're lucky if you get and a that's bunt. part of life. You know? <laughs> exactly. Like you know? else, yeah. So uh, there are those moments when, you know, paintings happen almost instantly without your even knowing they've happened. I mean, I've done some of my biggest work, yeah. 90 inches by 152 inches, yeah. in one night. Whereas I can slave for months over something 30 inches square, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. go figure. Yeah, but yeah. the failures can be as interesting. That's, yeah, that's what you intend. As, yeah. As, oh yeah, as, right? sure. And, oh, and yeah. also, you yeah. know, I imagine yeah. going into an artist studio that I respect or adore, you know, my, the peers from the hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And whatever they thought was bad and wanted to destroy would be as interesting to me as the successful painting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, even if you kept everything oh, yeah, sure. just for posterity yeah. and said, well, you know, what? maybe someday somebody is going to be interested to see the, the home runs yeah, and, yeah. The, you know, the oh, strikeouts yeah, and everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. And, and they put yeah. together a whole different yeah. show. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I, I just yeah. find... And unfinished work. Yeah. Unfinished work as well. yeah. yeah. You know, the humble jumble of art and art history yeah. is really fascinating, right? Absolutely. All, all the yeah. things that go wrong are... And I think accident plays a very, very important role yeah. in art yeah. making as well. It's yeah. kind of yeah. God's will in, <laughs> in, in, in the art, really. Yeah. That kind of brought us back to this whole series of uh, imaginary portraits. So um, that actually leads to my next question. So. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that was a very, very good discussion and, uh, and I want to just, you know, that kind of related to this series of um, uh, imaginary portraits. So, so Pierre, you start doing that and after that it was kind of put it aside, like you said. Um, you wasn't thinking until the end was looking at it. So maybe do you want to explain how this whole series come about? and? And then also maybe the end, how your encounter with this series and how does it inspire to the next series of works? So maybe we start with sure. Yeah. yeah well, these were done some 25, 
26 whatever years ago, 1994 they, was, they started. Mm -hmm. These are 20 of 29 that I did. And uh, there are two that, were, that are not framed here. And I'm not sure I know where they are in the studio now. But I destroyed seven. So you don't see seven. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I just thought they were terrible. <laughs> you know, really awful. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was doing these uh, between 1994 and 1996, over three years. So it's not like they're done in a concentrated uh, period of time. They sort of, you know, are spanning that period. While I was trying to uh, teach myself how to paint with oil again, because um, mm -hmm. I think I've mentioned before that I became quite dissatisfied with acrylic paint and what it could do. Mm -hmm. Very few people can use it really well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they must have been just adjuncts to, you know, what was going on in the studio, uh, interludes between painting sessions and, mm -hmm. and kind of a doodling too. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I did them, uh, and I'm glad I did them. <laughs> they're <laughs> sort of there. Turned into a show. Yeah, yeah. they're in a show, and um, and so I did them, and I put them away, and mm -hmm. I didn't show them to. Well, I showed them only to one person, an artist friend and his wife, on a studio visit, okay. and maybe that was about five years ago, uh -huh. something like that, mm -hmm. and then put them away again. So they've been, you know, hidden for 25 years mm -hmm. or more. And then uh, Dean sends me an email and says that he had just uh, seen them on my website. I probably have too much shit on my website, <laughs> so you know, there's a lot, lot of stuff there to look at. <clears throat> and, uh, and he's the first person who paid serious attention to them. Mm. And he told me that he uh, you know, felt some enthusiasm for them and you know, I'd never taken them seriously. Okay. So he made me take them seriously and I appreciate that. And so I thought, well, you know, if I don't get them framed, they'll, uh, you know, they'll definitely go into the scrap heap at mm -hmm. some point. Mm -hmm. So I had a little bit of extra money at that moment, and uh, so I got them framed, yeah. and then had Dean come over to the studio to see yeah. them, yeah. and then things yeah. evolved from there. Right. So I'll let yeah. Dean take over from sure. here. Of how, um... Yeah, like, you know, how do you first encounter this and how does it inspire you right. for yeah, pushing? Um, yeah. Right, so I saw them on the website yeah. um, and I loved them immediately mm -hmm. um, because they're figurative, because they're very sculptural. Mm -hmm. It's easy to imagine these in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, the colors, so obviously white and shades right. of white are important to yeah, me. Yeah, connected to your own <clears> work as well. Yeah. So also I had been doing, trying to do heads. I did this one for Edwin Parker, this one we have in the, in the show, yeah. um, many years ago, and I thought it was a good sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do heads after that, which were almost bad, and very bad. And mm. those, those maybe I destroyed. <laughs> or, they're, or they're in the studio, and I just, they're just set aside. Right, right, yeah. But I, I wasn't coming up with anything good. Nothing I liked. They were too much like a caricature. They were too much mm. like other things, the sculpture that I'd seen mm. before. And I could not find my way past that. Mm. And I, I've been doing legs and feet. Yeah. And those I think I was doing well. They were surprising me, confusing me sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So I didn't know, are they good, are they bad? And yeah. that's when I felt, well, then there's something going on. Mm -hmm. And so I leave them. That's also partially why not to destroy because I'm just not sure, and that's probably a good thing, yeah. right? Like Gustin coming into the studio and being mm -hmm. surprised at what he painted. That's right. So I, yeah. that's an important story to me. Yeah. Um, and why, why legs and feet? What that's a long answer. That's a long but answer. I, mean, <laughs> I, find, I find feet as, yeah. as um, characteristic yeah. of a person as their faces mm -hmm. or their hands, and they're less cliched. Okay. They're less well done, so it's it's a more of a an open territory, right. okay. you know, less to, to remind me of. Mm. So that was one important thing. Okay. So when I saw Pierre's heads, yeah. they suggested to me a a way to do do heads mm, mm, that mm. would make sense. So I can imagine his heads going with whatever bodies go with these legs and feet. Right. And so that was that's what started to inspire me. That finally I saw a way because they're not caricature mm -hmm. and they don't remind me right off of any other artist yeah right so again they're very they're very original and so I thought well 
I can copy him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so now, <laughs> now it, it turns out you have the whole series of heads now. So now I have heads, but they look very little like Pierre's. Yeah, so, which I mean, is also, yeah, which is, which very is good, good, but yeah. it, it still pushed me just to see what I could do. Yeah. And I'd still like to do some like mm. Pierre's, but I mean, even putting his into, actually putting him into three dimensions, they become more caricature-ish yeah. than a drawing does. I could imagine that. Yeah. But it's mm. nice because they're different, but it forms a very nice mm. converse, conversation together. They're almost kind of looking at each other, you know, start to form. Um, yeah, so yeah, we were discussing about, you know, the, the, the drawings and the paintings and also um, the head uh, sculpture. And um, the Edwin Parker is the first head that you did at the end, the first successful one. Yeah. And um, Edwin Parker is the original real name of Cy Tompley. Yes. And I believe both of you are very influenced by Cy Tompley's work and philosophy as well. Yes. So in the show, we intentionally uh, having one of the small black paintings up on the second floor of um, the gallery. And it's the only space you can kind of um, directly influence the main galleries. So we want to have the painting looking at the sculpture mm. of Edwin Parker and Edwin Parker looking back and say, can <laughs> but they're the yeah. same thing. But one is expression with sculpture, white sculpture, and one is expression expressed in a black painting. And um, so, yeah, I just, I'm very interested about how Cy Tompley plays in, in your art making and how does it influence you or, or inspire you. So maybe start with you, Pierre. That's a big question. You know, yeah. I, the question of influence is a, a huge one. And mm -hmm. so you can be very superficial about it. And it's something right. that goes, I think, really deep. And uh, I think that uh, uh, one of the things that I realize about my practice is that there are hundreds and thousands of influences, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and you have to embrace them. Uh, and it's because they are speaking to you. It is art speaking to you. I mean, yes. how can you not respond? I mean, you mm -hmm. don't respond to everything. You respond to what you respond to. So it's speaking to you. It's telling you something. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's giving you directives, too. And in a way, it's also giving you permissions. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that uh, I get from Cy Twombly is a permission to go deeper into gesture, mm. to go deeper into associations with poetry. Mm. Uh, and it's a call to be a little bit more courageous. Mm. And uh, it's a question almost always of what permission do you give yourself to do? Right. And how do you go beyond your own self-limitations or what you perceive to be your limitations? Yeah. So you take inspiration from other people's work in order to get there. I mean, from Joan Mitchell, from Jackie Schiaccio and mm -hmm. Cy Twombly and whoever. Yeah. Uh, and you can't be them and you're not trying to be them and you're not trying to make your work to be like their work. Yeah. But you're taking a kind of a command that, yeah, you have to go further. Mm. That's one way in which I approach it. But then, you know, at any given moment, I'd give another complete set of, different set of answers. I mean, right. there, there are multiplicities involved here. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but it is a question also of how your work is infused with your understanding of art history. I mean, you mm -hmm. go back before Cy Twombly. Yeah. I, mean, uh, I mean, he was working from Poussin mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and took his inspirations from what mm -hmm. he was trying to do. Yeah. So there's all these interlockings, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then that reflects on the interlockings in your own work, too. Yes, you know, what you're right. doing now in 2021, mm -hmm. how it goes back to what you were doing in, say, mm -hmm. 1980 or 1965, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Well, that's true. Yeah. So you influence yourself, too, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, but it is a conversation between all of us, yes. and I think that's something that you have to be open to. Mm. The end? But for me, it's having found a kindred spirit. 
Mm. So um, it's a, lo a lot of overlapping interests of, of uh, history and poetry. And in his sculpture, color, because his, his sculpture tends to be all white mm -hmm. or predominantly white. Right. Um, he wouldn't make pieces like this, but they at the same time don't look dissimilar from this, mm. mainly, mainly color. And then in my surfaces, I see, you know, reflections of the way he would paint, the, the mm -hmm. impasto of his paint, right. yeah. you know, but also, you know, Robert Ryman and using yes. white exclusively yeah. that way and, and just looking at surface. Um, mm. So I think Twombly seems to have wanted to go back to first principles or mm. the, the sources of, right. of Western art. Mm -hmm. Right, and so then I have a leaning towards those same beginnings, mm -hmm. you know, in philosophy, the yeah. early Greek philosophers, yeah. the early Greek art, yeah. and also right? history and literature as well. Literature, yeah, the yeah. architecture. So yeah. I mean, he moved over there to be even closer, right, to, the, the source, to Italy. Yeah. He, so he's really in the source yeah. and yeah. surrounded by it. But um, his sculpture I didn't come to t till much later. I mean, I knew his painting first and then only later because his sculpture really didn't get shown even, mm. I think in t into the 90s really is when shows specifically devoted to his sculpture would show up because he did it a lot for himself. Yeah. And so I was working at Dia Art Center in New York and we had Twombly sculpture there. Mm. And, and, and that was a revelation mm. for me to have seen it. Um, and so, you know, I was already making my sculpture in a way that when I saw Twombly sculpture, mm -hmm. it was, you know, my God, here's somebody I can relate to completely, right? right. That we were already okay. s doing similar things, mm -hmm. which I'm happy to have seen him before I started to do mine, not to feel as indebted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so you mentioned history and literatures and uh, are you also Pierre you're also uh, very much coming from that background of uh, literatures and yep. especially poetry as well and uh, and they are uh, infused in all the works in in this show here right now so maybe I just want you, know, you even call the um, the paintings like white poems and they are pay homage to um, the poets such as Anne Carson from Quebec um, do, yeah would you uh, talk about how poetry um, works in your painting, like how the, you connect them together? Well, it goes back to poetics, and mm -hmm. uh, it really goes back to uh, the figures, Charles Olson and Robert Creeley and Robert Duncan and Robin Blazer and what was called the San Francisco Renaissance and mm -hmm. the New American Poetry. Okay. And uh, Olson uh, wrote some very important essays that were extremely influential on a generation, my generation, and yeah. the previous generation of Canadian writers. Mm. And it engendered a lot of controversy in the literary world across Canada. But uh, you had a group like the Tisch poets here, George Bowering, Fred Wall, right. Frank right. Davy, etc. Yeah. But the key uh, statements that, uh, that Olson uh, made, and I'm trying to think now, I can't even remember the title of the essay. Mm. It's funny how I found it. Mm -hmm. I was doing, studying at the Academy Julien yeah. in Paris yeah. in 1964-65 yeah. on the Rue du Dragon in Saint-Germain-des-Prés okay. and down the street was the American Library. <laughs> so I went into the American Library and they had a bookshelf, uh, shelves with poetry yeah. and I discovered Donald Allen's seminal and very important anthology, mm -hmm. The New American Poetry. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I flipped it open and it opened to Charles Olson's essay, yeah. which I can't remember the title <laughs> now. One of the secondary essays is called A Letter to Elaine B. Feinstein, where he answers a question yeah. from a young uh, American poet. Mm -hmm. But the two key precepts of The New American Poetry, which I think have infused my work, ever since, both in writing and in painting, yeah. is that uh, form is never more than an extension of content. Okay. Well, there are three. And then uh, one perception must immediately lead to a further perception. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the emphasis on proprioception, that is, okay. 
the uh, the ability that we have to Sense feel ourselves in space, and yeah. that finally comes down to sensibility within the organism by movement of its own tissue. Right. That's the medical definition of proprioception. Yeah, yeah. So it is this ability that we have as human beings yeah. to do this simple little thing. I don't have to <laughs> look where my nose is, I can find right. it, you know, etc. And right. that's the drunk test and what have yeah. you. Uh, so it means that it's the intelligence of the body that's involved in the making of the work. Mm -hmm. It's not merely uh, uh, the look of a body yeah. or the appearance of a body, yeah. but it's emanating from the whole body. So mm -hmm. it's the intelligence of the body. It's not merely rational. It's not merely conceptual. Mm -hmm. It's not merely emotional, but it's fuller than that. Right. It's the entire spectrum of the perceptual and proprioceptual field that you're yeah. engaging in. So when you're doing the painting, are you, do you think about the poet as a person or do you think about the poetry? Like, for instance, for these examples here. No, yeah. no, you don't think about it. Well, anyway. yeah, there's, you know, yeah, sure, things are floating there. Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, obviously, I mean, the lines that I'm putting into these paintings now mm -hmm. are pretty simple. They're from uh, Carson's translation of Catullus and they're very romantic lines, mm. uh, wine, milk, honey, flowers and yeah. permutations of that and okay. then mute ash mm. which relates to the famous Catullus poem 101 mm. and uh, so yeah I've, I've got them written down I've been reading it I'm feeling it and I'm thinking it uh, but when I'm actually painting then you know the, the words are going in there and are being obliterated again and again mm -hmm. uh, but it's not like I'm trying to illustrate the poem or yeah, of course, yeah. translate it or right. anything like that. So it's more like in the subconsciousness. I'm, in, I'm incorporating yeah. it. Yeah, okay. It's becoming part of the body. Right, okay. Do you have the... Yeah. And Charles Olson, he was at Black Mountain. Black right? Mountain, yes. And, that's, and he was, and Twombly was, Twombly was, was there with him. Well, everybody, big, everybody uh, that uh, we influence. revere went through Black Mountain yeah. pretty well. Robert mm, uh, Rauschenberg, yeah. Jasper Johns, I mean, that's right. from the very highest to, you know, John most Cage, famous. John Cage, John, John Cage, Cage yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. Merce Cunningham. Okay. But I think Olson was a, an influ a big influence on Twombly. He was, yeah, yeah. Mm. and uh, Olson, huge influence on everybody, yeah. really. Yeah. Uh, and yet, nobody's teaching him that as far as I know now. I right. mean, yeah. again, how things come in and out of focus over time. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's also one of the reasons I really want to do this show with you guys because I am also very captivated by that whole history and, mm -hmm. and yeah and, and also the aesthetics and also the philosophy yeah. as well. So so yeah, the end, um, yeah, like uh, history plays a very important role on this yeah. work, especially the the five generals. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about yeah, and also on the head as well, some of the Roman histories and Greek history. Can you talk about how they related to your work here in this show? history, you know, history of sculpture, history of the base in sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of some of the titles, they're historical titles, but it's the poetry of the, the words that's important to me. Mm. You know, Agis of Arcadia, it's just the, the sound of it suggests things. Um, my own readings, you know, the, the history of ancient Greece or the Persian Wars mm. are interesting for some reason of going back to first principles. So mythology, yeah. you know, you can either follow or fo follow followers or go back and read the original mm -hmm. and then work and work forwards from that right. on your own and hopefully come to a more original um, mm -hmm. destination than if you follow a follower okay. who's already, right? Okay. All right, so yeah, here comes my last question, so actually. So, uh, well, this show is very bright and uh, the palette is, uh, we reduce it to just pure white. So um, I, I like to get, you know, a sense of how, how you guys feel about, you know, this approach. I, um, I feel very enlightened. One of the things about from a lot of visitors coming to the show, they feel um, very refreshing, they say. Yeah, we also light up the show to, mm -hmm. to the maximum, just give it all the attention to light and, and brightness. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of show out there right now in our world, it's very political, you know, racism, black lives, uh, uh, matters, yeah. movements, and all the other uh, protests, political uh, people in the world. Right. Um, so, uh, in a way, this show is very much about art, pure art. 
sort of arts process, you know, and the conversations. So, um, and I think people actually get it when they come in. They 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 feel it. They they feel the refreshing of that. So, so I think it's very good. But um, yeah, I I I like to hear about how you guys feel about that, and also if there's one thing that you want the visitor, the viewers to take away from this show, what what would that be? Hmm. Well, it's interesting to hear that you're getting that response. That's rather nice. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, I, you know, I hadn't really thought of those. Those weren't, that wasn't part of the spectrum of my intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it's very hard to know what an audience is going to get. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you, you can't have expectations of that. Oh, yeah. um, but it is nice, I think, to have a show that, you know, is a little bit art for art's sake. <laughs> yeah. You know, we've been so deprived of seeing so many things and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we're so deprived, to, you know, of so much these days. Mm -hmm. yes. But it, it occurred to me that it's a kind of an irony that these are imaginary portraits at a time when we're all running around with masks and have to <laughs> and need to. Uh, yeah. And we're not seeing everybody's face fully. Yeah. And so I thought, I thought it was kind of ironic and kind of propitious that you know, here we are focusing on faces, yes. uh, on people, mm -hmm. and uh, that it brings in that kind of human aspect that uh, sometimes gets lost yeah. in, you know, the political wars that do yeah. have to be fought and are ongoing. I mean, so many of my shows have right. direct political implications, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm very much involved in that, yeah. but I don't feel any political yeah, like most, most of the response from the, uh, the viewer is they actually see that more about the connection, the history of art, really. I mean, mm -hmm. you can see probably Picasso here, and as I mentioned, I, I see Gertrude Stein here, and that looks like the Suzuki Sen um, Masters and African art. So there, there, there seems a bit of a, um, yeah, idea about the sort of extension to the art history, which is, again, bring it up to the pure arts idea. So that was quite nice, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, well, you know, I didn't, I, there is one that is definitely a redoing of Picasso, and that's the third from the end. Uh, okay. That is a redoing of a Picasso I see. Okay, there you that go. I saw in a catalog. And- uh, All right, so it did show through, so that's- kind Yeah, of nice, and, but it's interesting because, you know, I don't have a lot of confidence in my ability to draw. I don't mm. consider myself a draftsman. Mm. I can't draw worth shit with a pencil, for example. <laughs> you know, and I, it just bugs me. I can draw sort of with a brush. Yeah. And I always remember, you know, uh, Matisse apparently yelled at Picasso once, yeah. I can't draw, you can't draw, nobody can draw. Mm. And then Frank Stella, when he was in, at Yale, yeah. whenever it came to drawing class, he'd write on his a pad on his uh, easel and say, yeah. I can't draw, and he'd leave the class. You know? <laughs> and, and, I mean, and they all become a great artist. Look, <laughs> yeah, they all become great artists, and they all can really draw, you know, yeah. in a certain way. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it is a question, what is drawing? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, naturally with the poetry thing, you know, you take it, the word, mm. and you take it as drawing from the well, for example, right. or yeah. drawing something out. Okay. Uh, it's obviously not depiction mm. that is my interest. Mm. But then, you know, the difference between observational painting and observational drawing, yeah, yeah I mean, again, these, class, cl these classifications that yeah. we make, yeah. the fact of the matter is that you are observing what you're doing as you're doing it. I mean, that's part of the proprioceptive process. So mm. even though there isn't a model before you or a photograph, yeah. you're actually observing something, yeah. you know. And it is the acuity of your observation mm. in the moment of its making yeah. that makes the piece, Very or you true. hope that it does, Very you know. True. So um, if there's one thing that you'd like the viewer to take away from this show? Yeah, 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 that we're all here. <laughs> and, <laughs> we are here. You know, <laughs> and we have body parts. <laughs> and we yeah. have heads without bodies. We have bodies, <laughs> mm. parts of the body without heads. Yeah, yeah no, you know, uh, get what you get. Okay. You know? Engage. Yeah. Uh, engage. Okay. Just look at something closely and then mm. engage with your reactions to it. I mean, that's the feedback loop. Right. Uh, so, none of us are here to give answers to anything. That's true. Uh, but everybody is their here. Interpretation, yeah. Everybody is here to be alive to their own observations of the world and then move from it. Okay. 
Dan, you have something to add? Yeah, I, um, I think there are far better ways to affect change than mm -hmm. art. I don't, if people are interested in making political art, God bless them, that's their interest, right? right. That's their right to do that. Yeah. I don't think it's a, an effective tool. I think there's you know, way more effective things to do. Mm. You know, I yeah. would cut all arts funding per, personally mm. and give it all to medicine. Right? I think mm -hmm. those are the places, education, medicine, housing, those are things that really make a difference. Mm -hmm. My sculpture, unless I can barter it to save somebody's life, it's not going to do, it's not going to do a life any good in those terms, right? Yeah. It'll maybe brighten up your day, it'll give you something to think about, and those are all very valuable things. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I recognize, and I'm happy to accept the limitations of what I do, mm -hmm. And it's not my interest, so I, I try to make my contribution the way I can mm. to the betterment of the world in sculpture. I think art makes a better world, right? Yeah. I so I contribute to that. Yeah. And so it doesn't need to address a particular, yeah. a particular issue yeah. in terms of whiteness. Um, that's just a, a show that I've wanted to do for a very long time of mm. all white work, but a, a historical, you know, and all different cultures, because white, again, for all cultures, almost all time, has been a very important color. Mm -hmm. You know, it's for, for, for purity, for, you know, spiritual elevation, yes, for yes. any number of mm -hmm. reasons. People respond to this color, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I think that's why it's so long lasting. And it's also one, one of the things that I'm um, taking away is also it's, it, it, it's light, yes. you know, the, the white light encom encompassing all the spectrum, the rainbow colors, right. and, and all that as well. So. Yeah. But I would disagree with Dean about cutting I, arts I, funding. I, I was going to say that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And I would disagree with Dean about, you know, not, art, art not having a political effect. That's right, I yeah. think it does. I think it can. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, it, or it certainly is a way of responding to the political yes. world, too. Oh, you can respond to yeah. it, but I don't know you move it. Well, I think, move it. Yeah, well, I, think, think uh, like I think it does Picasso's move it. Yeah, I think it does move it because Picasso or Goya, you know. It, 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 I don't it, think Goya. I think we look at Goya. I don't know that the king was moved by Goya, and mm. I don't think the war ended a day earlier. I don't okay. think Hitler, Mussolini, or Franco cared at all that that mm. that Picasso painted it. Yeah. I knew it became an embarrassment for the United Nations mm. to have it in the building. Yeah. Right, and then to talk about war when you're standing behind, you know, glorifying war and having this mural mm -hmm. or a Guernica behind them right. showing the horrors of war. Mm -hmm. But at the moment that Picasso painted it, yeah. I'm not sure it helped. Okay. You know, if he would have funded the resistance, that probably would have done more. Mm, I see. Uh, so you're more pra well, pra I'm pragmatic, sure. pragmatic approach. Yeah. I'm sure he was involved yeah. in that. No, too. no, he may. <laughs> I'm just saying that I think yeah. we need to recognize, you know, not glorify what art can do. It can do what it can do, mm. and it's limited. Mm. Well, fine, I don't think, and it's I don't fine. Think, it's I don't just, think it's glorifying it. I think that uh, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the work itself becomes exemplars of freedom. Uh, the freedom of the human spirit, yeah. mm. and a testament to that, and I think that's an inspiration, and I think that moves people. It can be an inspiration, yeah. but yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't. No, it's not going to make the immediate change, no. and it doesn't. Although you go back to, was it Keats or Shelley? Poets are the unacknowledged mm. legislators of the world, yeah. and you go back to figures like Blake, and I mean, he certainly right. had the ambition to change the world. Yeah. Definitely, uh, there's yeah. the ambition. Yeah. And maybe he didn't, but I think he's had a huge impact in many ways. Anyway, yeah, I, I think, I think <laughs> we're not going to resolve yeah, the no. debate now. <laughs> I think what happened is everything kind of interconnected yeah. together. Yeah. You can really like kind of separate the political from the spiritual from one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they all related, and art definitely have a huge role um, to play throughout the history, and. From your work as well, you never know. You could be like a young student coming in and look at your work, it's so inspired and it changes yes. his whole life. Well, that's there you no, no, that's, that, I think yeah. it can yeah. inspire people. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's why I'm sitting here, it's why you're sitting here, right. why you're yeah. sitting You know, it made us want to do what we do. Yes, okay. And it, maybe it can inspire you, and if you lead a good artist's life, you'll be a better person. Mm -hmm. If this is how you want to contribute to the world, I think you're making a good contribution. Yeah. Um, you can call that political if you want, but I think the kind of 
political work you're talking about is not general, well, we'll just mm. inspire a young person, mm. right? I mean, I definitely think that artists and an artist's life is an example to how a life could and should be led. Good, good. Yeah. Well, in either case, this is show, does show food that is very much about art uh, itself, and it, it, it does kind of stand out from a lot of shows out there, which is it's quite, quite nice. So uh, thank you both for your time. Thank you, Lam. And thank then you for having there's going to be a lot of visitors for meeting <laughs> the artists today. So, uh, so we're looking forward to that. And um, the show with Pia Coupe and Dean Kiner, uh, Imaginary Portraits, will be in Canton Sartine until March 27th. So thank you. Thank you.